Hello and welcome to Long Bangers. I'm not Matty. Hello, welcome to Sean Opinion Hibs. I'm not Calvin. I'm not Jack. I'm not Charlie. Welcome to Hibs. Pod. I'm not Gavin. And welcome to Down the Slope. And yes, I'm Ewan. Uh, we'll all be very lucky to be joined by the new Hibs manager, Lee Johnson. Uh, Lee, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Thanks very much for inviting me on, guys. Uh, during my research, I think I've seen a fair bit of all of you. So, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Good. Um, well, I guess, will we go first, Harry? Right. Ah, you crack on, you, you go, for, you well, go first. Go question, first. Um, Lee, I guess the first, the first thing is, obviously, you've been in post now a couple of weeks. Um, how, how have you found it? Um, has it been as busy as you thought it would be? Yeah, it's mad busy. Um, it's funny, when you're managing, you're out of work, you go four months and, and literally probably get about five phone calls and four of them are from your mum. So uh, all of a sudden you get back in work and it's, it's constant, you know, you take a call, you miss three. Um, but it's good. It's the it's that sort of hamster wheel, if you like, you're on and I like, just love it. You know, just love being in the mix, love like the, the building process, the, the fact that meeting new staff, making new connections. And obviously, what a better place to do it at a historic, iconic club like Hibs. Yes, um, on you go, yeah. Oh, no, on you go, ahead, man. Um, yeah, one, one of the things I think that got the fans really excited for you joining and um, that came through in the statements after you got announced um, was how uh, passionate and driven you were to and uh, ambitious you were for the club. Um, I know you're just in the door, but have you got your ambitions set for the season? What's the goal for next season at the current moment? I know we've not had the transfer window as of yet, but at the current moment in time, are we looking for third and decent cup runs or? Listen, I'm really positive. I think there's the makings there of a good squad. Like, we know we have to add. There's no doubt in that. I think we all know that. Um, I think the players know, will know that themselves. Um, but, you know, there, there's quality in that squad. And it wasn't long ago, what, a year ago to the day where you did finish third. And, and obviously the cup finals were there as well. So, like... I'm ambitious, like you said, and I expect everybody else to be ambitious as well as the fans, you know, and that comes with an expectation and a pressure. But for me, that that's the privilege. Like I like the sort of big, old, sort of historic football clubs. And uh, that was really what attracted me to Hibs. And listen, it's front foot, you know, we're coming straight through the door um, and we're trying to smash it down. So whoever we play, um, we're going to play to win. Like you'll see that, I'm pretty sure, right from the start. Uh, we might not win them all, but we'll certainly die trying. And I think that's key, really, to to the attitude of it all. You know, we, we need the fans to be on side. Like I, I saw a little bit of disconnect, in my opinion, um, with the sort of fan base and the players that I didn't like. Um, and listen, it wasn't much, but uh, I feel that like we could really pack that stadium. And I think if we could pack that stadium bring sort of really high tempo forward thinking football aggressive football um i think everybody will come back i think they'll in, enjoy the process and and we can be as one if you like again and i think if we do that that can be really really powerful in the scottish league and um, yeah i'm looking forward to it and uh, nothing phases myself in terms of of that pressure to to try and win games uh, in fact it's something that just just love and absolutely thrive off Thanks. And just one more from me before we move on. Um, what is it? Because um, when Sean Maloney first came in, he kind of promised us attacking football as well. I know you've got a history of doing that, that at your former clubs. Um, is it something tactically that you're going to instill in the players or is it more of a mentality thing that will drive them to play this attacking football that you're talking about? I think it's everything, really. Do you know, what does attacking football look like? Well, in transition, it's really important to, to play forward early. I think that's key. It's not long. It's just to play forward early. I think sometimes teams can get caught just recycling the ball. Um, we do want to have control. So there's no doubt that, that we want the ball. You know, we don't want 85% possession. We want sort of like 55 because we want to be able to use the transition as well to our benefit. Obviously, you have to recruit players that can run and repeatedly run. You have to be able to play at tempo. What does tempo look like? Well, ball goes out for a throw-in, for example, can you get the ball back within five seconds um, and, and really set that tone as early as possible in games? And then when it comes to the final third, obviously you need to flood the box as much as possible. So who can you get in the box? Two centre-forwards, a wide man, potentially a full-back, an attacking centre-midfielder. Um, and then obviously you have to manage behind the ball to then try and win the ball back quickly in the final third and uh, produce more attacking play. So, 
that I, it's all good and well talking about it, isn't it? You've got to see it. And, um, and that's the key. Obviously, we'll work to that philosophy uh, within the club. And I think the boys will buy into that. But you do have to recruit around that. You know, it, it does um, require a certain uh, individual quality, if you like, physically and tactically, as well as technically, to be able to bring that style of football. But the great thing is we've got a really good academy as well. And that was something that really attracted me to Hibs. You know, obviously um, having the under 18s just win the league, which is phenomenal. And, and they'll be pitting their wits against the best sides in Europe. So uh, what a set of development players that we've got coming through. And that becomes really important because obviously fans can relate um, to young local players and players that come through the, the youth set up in the academy. So it's something that I'm sort of well versed on at my football clubs. And, uh, I think it's important to be able to fund success, uh, have young players come through. Thanks, Lee. Um, hi, Lee. Yeah, so uh, clearly you've got a a very, um, well, quite a clear picture of what you want the team to do. And you've got a good idea now of what you need for players to be able to do um, in order to achieve that. I'm just interested where you see the kind of cause for optimism in the, in the team at the moment without naming players uh, for obvious reasons, kind of talk about areas and then, uh, you know, on the same coin, what areas do you think there's room for most improvement and, and how do you see sort of ushering that improvement in? Yeah, I think, first of all, that sort of final third, I think there's um, a big opportunity to, to improve. You know, I think you can do that, obviously, by recruiting players, by developing players, um, but also add in what you believe is the right thing to do tactically. Um, it does require obviously motivated players to want to play that role and, and the physical element that goes with it is going to be difficult to get in pre-season. I think we're a little bit late back, if I'm honest with you, but that was already set in stone considering our first competitive game is sort of mid-July and that's a cup obviously we want to be successful in as well. Um, only really gives us sort of 17, 18 training days. So the recruitment as well, naturally, is key. You know, you've got to have that pitch personality uh, for the forward players. And I think probably just looking at the likes of Boyle, when you lost Boyle, you realise a player like that with so much pitch personality um, can have a detrimental effect if you lose them. So we need to add quality. I think we need to add numbers um, higher up the pitch. And, and I believe we will. You know, I'm looking at all the lists that are already here. Uh, I'm bringing my own input, obviously, to the list uh, from my uh, knowledge and contacts down south, but also all across Europe. And, and we, we're starting to formulate a good list. You know, I think we're speaking to, to good players uh, across various age ranges. And um, obviously, Hibs is a fantastic club. Edinburgh is a beautiful city, so it's not too tough a sell. Uh, we've just got to make sure we win uh, when we're competing for these particular players that we want. Hi Lee, nice to meet you. It's uh, Colin here that we uh, introduced earlier on. How are you doing? Um, I'm just wondering, like my wife is a season ticket holder or was a season ticket holder of 30 years plus. She's not renewed this year yet. How would you, what would you say to entice her back? Almost like an elevator pitch, if you like, just short and sharp. What would you say? Well, first and foremost, we need her. I think that's the key. You know, we want to make it that the fans are absolutely a part of our performance. And I did mention that in my sort of uh, initial press conference, but it's so true, you know, especially fans that have been there for sort of 15, 20, 30 years. Like this is an 80 year relationship that you, you've got with this football club. Um, and like people like myself are, are just custodians, if you like, of these job roles. Um, but what we can do is, is fight for each other. We can be successful on the pitch. And I think we can send everybody home happy more often than not but then obviously work towards the sort of real showstopper at the end of the season. And, and that is success, whether that be cups uh, or league or Europe, whatever that may look like. And I, I honestly think that's a, that's a possibility. I don't think it's too far away from reality if we make good decisions. And I, and I hope that people see the players that we've already brought in, you know, like David Marshall and uh, Nohan Kenner, uh, two very good players. And like I say, we've got more, I think on the back burner, sort of ready to go. Um, and for me, uh, it should be an easy sell because she's already 
uh, got an affiliation with the club. It's a new beginning and it's a brave new beginning and uh, we want her to be a part of it. I just need to find the money and then that's the, that's the next one. <laughs> that's, that was a main reason, right? But I just wanted to see what you would say. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Lee, I think the, the question that comes to my mind in terms of the two new signings that were brought in, are you sort of a manager that likes to get business done early or are you a manager that takes it when it comes or how do you see yourself sort of operating in the transfer windows at Hibs? Yeah, I just think you have to make good decisions. You know, if there's a good one that you can do early, um, sometimes it's maybe worth paying that little bit more. I think pre-season is absolute paramount to a successful season. Um, we've had a lot of injuries at the football club, not so many muscle injuries, but a lot, a lot of contact injuries. So like, players want to sort of bed into the season. Obviously, there's going to be a lot to learn for lads. They're going to need to have that growth mindset, really, the minute they walk through the door. Um, and they have to be fired with enthusiasm because that's what we want. You know, if we're going to play that style of football, um, they're going to need to come in every day with an enthusiasm and uh, an attitude, if you like, to be the best version of themselves. And I think if, if fans are seeing that, if coaches are seeing that, um, I think you, you can forgive maybe some technical errors or, or some tactical errors as long as the attitude is absolutely on point. And, and we've got to create a culture. It seems like a, a really nice vibe around the training ground um, already, you know, with the staff that are there. Uh, it all seems very positive. And we also need that bit of emotional stability, don't we? Do you know, like the players need that. Uh, I need that. The club needs that. And hopefully we'll get that um, and have this time to sort of settle in on a pre-season. But in terms of recruitment, it, you've got to make good decisions. You know, in the end, you, you, your recruitment... Um, Will, will be the strengths and the weakness of you as a manager. So, uh, you know, we have to get that right, not just on a technical level, but on a human level. You know, we want good people coming through the door. They have to add value to the squad, to the spirit. Um, sometimes that's harder for the younger lads, but we need to create an environment where they can step up and bring that personality to the pitch and to the training ground every day. Hi there, Leo. Uh, Calvin from the Strong Opinion Hibs podcast. <clears throat> Just got a question for you. Ron Gordon came out and said that two uh, clubs that inspired him and he sort of hoped that Hibs would be like was Sevilla and Atletico Madrid. Are there any clubs out there at the moment or the way they're run or coached or managed that you look to for inspiration? Yeah, I think for me, the City group, you know, you look at Manchester City and, and the work that the group as a whole have done. I've been so lucky with them because they, they've sort of let me in, if you like, for the last 10 years, really, since I was at Oldham. So I've managed to watch those guys develop across everything, you know, across the data side of their um, their sort of recruitment. Like they've obviously bought New York City. I think they're on about nine mm. clubs now and they, and they continue to buy. Um, but they've also got to win and got to be successful. I think it was amazing, like, last year where um, I think last season Man City had won, Trois had got promoted, Melbourne had won the um, Australian League, um, MLS was won by New York City, do you know what I mean? So it was a, yeah. it was real success if you like all the way through and you need good people, you know, you need, you need a clear alignment from top to bottom and obviously you need to be able to uh, to develop young players and win football matches. So that's always the balance, like the young players, the, the average age of the squad, uh, keeping your best players fit. And uh, I've been doing a lot of work on, on that side of it as well in this four months, you know, making sure that we periodise the programme to keep your best players fit. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to Harry for letting me jump in front of him here. Um, you, you signed in David uh, David Marshall, Nohan Kenna. Um, obviously, David Marshall was at the later end of his career. Hibs over the last couple of, well, the last season in particular, have signed very young players, and it looked like we were maybe lacking a bit of experience. Do you see us signing that sort of profile of player as in the younger bracket this season, or would you look to mix it up? Yeah, I think you need to mix it up. Like my, my opinion on it is. Um, it's quite interesting in terms of, again, the study that I've been doing on it. Like the perfect blend for me is like four, eight, eight, four. So you'd have like four in the uh, breakthrough category of like 16 to 20. 
Uh, you then have eight in that sort of 20 to 25 year old bracket. And that's where your assets are, you know, really for the football club to make it sustainable. You then have eight in your prime um, from like 25 to the age of 30. And then four in that twilight, which is uh, sort of 30 to 35 or plus. And I think like getting that balance is really important because you need the seniors to be unbelievable human beings and, and winners, if you like, because they've obviously got to spread that through the club. Um, and I think David Marshall obviously is a, is a key personality in terms of that leading the dressing room um, coming in through the door, you know, a wealth of experience, but also a very good goalkeeper still. And I think you know, they can't just be great lads and not good players. They've got to be both. But we're probably short in that prime area. Um, now, the problem with the prime players is they're the most expensive. Um, and if they're not expensive, there's probably something wrong. So what we've got to do is develop uh, our own, um, stepping into that mould. The likes of, I think, Ryan Porteous, for example, is a really good example. He's 23, but in my mind, he's that sort of prime player, if you like, coming into the um, sort of peak of his career and should have a very successful uh, next few years in the game. So, you know, we've got to get that balance. Um, but look, we, we've got all ages on our lists, um, young, like very young in terms of trying to add those development players in, um, those 20 to 25 year olds that are really that emerging talent. It's so important that one because they're the ones you can actually, you can buy early. You know, they might be on the fringes of Premier League squads or they might be championship substitutes. You know, they're desperate to play and we can offer them that vehicle um, to, to go and be successful at a really good club. So for us, naturally, that, that is a market for us. Um, and if you recruit to perfection in terms of the attributes that you want for that position, then obviously it's my job to organise them as best as possible. But of course, they make more mistakes than the prime players because they're less experienced. So uh, getting that balance to the squad, um, both in terms of personalities, but also in terms of age and demographic becomes really important. Hi again, Lee. Um, I just wanted to tap in into knowing Kenny, um, or Kenna, sorry. Um, a lot of us have done our research. I know he was kind of a football manager wonder kid and just seeing the tweets from Leeds fans after he left, they were relatively shocked that he came to Hibs. I think he was quite highly touted down south. Um, what, first of all, how did the club manage to secure him? And secondly, what can we expect from him as a player? Well, I think the club had done a great job in securing him. You know, it was one that um, was on my list, but the club were already in contact with anyway. Um, so, like, to get a, you know, 19-year-old sort of England international um, with that experience that's, that's had sort of a lot of games on the bench for Leeds this year and been excellent for their under-23 sides is a real coup. And that's the type of player that I'm talking about. You know, it's the one that wants to... Um, progress his career is happy to jump across border because sometimes in England there's a little bit of a stigma against that you know we've got to break that down hopefully um, by me coming up and, and I've played obviously in Scotland and in England I know how both how tough it is and how good it is in terms of the passion of the fans uh, the level of the football so it's up to me to articulate those type of things um, down to the, to the English players so I think in terms of attributes, he's a good size. You know, he's sort of 6'2", depending on uh, how high he brushes his hair. You might even call him 6'3". We did have that discussion. Um, like, good athleticism, but really good tactically and a good reader of the game. Um, of course, we need to improve certain elements of his game. Um, but I think that, like, to put a versatile player like that, because he can play holding midfield, he can also play centre-half, um, and be able to nurture somebody like that is important. And he's got to feel like he belongs at a club like Hibs. So it's up to us and you as well to um, to do as much as you can to make players like that feel welcome. And it's not easy. You know, you move into a different culture, a different environment, a big club. It's the first time he would have had exposure to, you know, Twitter, Instagrams. He will be recognised in the street where maybe he wasn't before. You know, he'll be playing games. He'll be scoring goals, winning games, costing us games. And, and I think that comes with a, a bit of a turmoil, if you like, but um, he's got to get through that 
um, and I'm sure his quality and his personality will enable him to be really successful here. I know it's been really uh, transfer heavy already, Lee, but I'm going to keep it going. Um, is there any sort of specific areas of the pitch that you think we do need to strengthen or even in, in, in the specific age categories? And you obviously mentioned the League Cup earlier as the sort of plan to try and have the squad as strong as possible for that to sort of really attack that competition because obviously it's probably not something you're used to having competitive games that early. Yeah, I think it's something that's a bit of a challenge for me, if I'm honest. Because in an ideal world, I'd want sort of a five-week lead-in minimum into the first competitive game. So we haven't got that, but um, obviously we're going to have to work really, really smart um, with this. I think like the programme that's been sent out is, is excellent. And I, obviously I trust the players to be able to um, be fit and stay fit. Obviously they need to enjoy themselves and relax as well. But I think the modern player is pretty good at that. You know, so in my era... Uh, we'd have the old bin bags on where we sort of came back and had literally a month, six weeks off. And I remember Graham Taylor just literally running us for about um, three weeks, I think, anywhere we possibly could to, to drop everybody's weight. So it doesn't normally happen now. We want um, players to come in sort of under 9% where possible. And if not, then they'll be doing extra sessions. So they'll know that. And in the back of their mind, uh, they'll be like being a little bit careful with what they put into their body. Um, but look, it's an important competition. You know, I, I've experienced a cup win with Kilmarnock um, winning that competition. And uh, that was one of the best days of my life, if I'm honest with you, in terms of my football career, beating Celtic in the final. So like, I'm um, sort of first hand to, to say to the boys that this is something that we've got to go for and got to go for early. Um, we have got a few injuries and a few injuries that um, sort of cross over into pre-season from last season. Um, even more reason to get the correct recruits in through the door um, as early as possible, but not to the detriment of getting the value and the right personalities and attributes to make us successful. Yeah, Lee, you just touched on there playing for Kilmarnock and you obviously played for our neighbours in the opposite half of the city. So what are you hoping that your experience playing up here, managing down England, that you can sort of amalgamate into one managing hubs? Yeah, well, I think, look, to be fair, in terms of experience, I've, I've managed a lot of games now. You know, I'm 40 years old, but I retired at 31 for an ankle injury. And I think it's over like 470 games now. So it's a fair chunk. And, and my experiences in Scotland weren't amazing as a player, you know, at Hearts, like it was a disaster of a regime at that point for me with Romanov um, in charge and everything that he brought. Um, so although I like loved the lads, you know, I've stayed friends with the majority of those lads all the way through. Um, it was a great feeling. It was a feeling of frustration, if you know what I mean, because I felt uh, that the club was being pushed in the wrong direction by somebody that didn't have uh, genuine ambitions for the place. Um, at the same time, at Kilmarnock, it was a, it was a short stint and a, and a successful stint in that sense because obviously winning the cup as well. So, like, I am half Scottish, like, genuinely in terms of my mum's side's all Scottish. Uh, I'm pretty sure you'll see my nan uh, fly up and down and she's quite a lively character, so she'll, she'll be in and about the place. Um, but that's important to me as well, you know, to sort of connect with the roots um, and make sure that it's successful. It's as simple as that. All you can offer really is that genuine hard work um, and, and doing everything you can um, to provide the club the best opportunity to be successful. And the good thing is every club I've ever had um, that I've taken on has been left in a much better place. And I think that is a decent sign um, of success. You just secured the Hibs manager, Lee Johnson, Blast, former club hearts, uh, title in tomorrow's papers uh, um, with Romanov. I'm just uh, being honest with it. I think, listen, I, you know, I think uh, like it's important that, that people people did know that at the time, you know, but it was just like football's tough. Like to be a footballer, like it's not easy, by the way, you know, because you're desperate to be one of those players that are the eight regulars. And for whatever reason, sometimes politically, as it was in those type cases, it's not impossible. It was a really good team, actually, we had at that point as well. Um, don't get me wrong. 
um, but it was a it was a it was a real sort of learning curve for me, um, having having been brought up here from Yeovil and been a sort of regular and played two hundred games um, as a as a consistent starter. Um, to to take another look at the the current Hibs squad, you mentioned Ryan Portiers as a player that you you see good potential in and kind of coming into his peak. I'm interested. What are his attributes that you, you know, when you look at as a manager, you think, yeah, great, that's a player I want to coach. And are there any other individuals in the squad that you could identify just briefly, you know, what attributes they have that you think, you know, that'll work in my team and uh, I'd love to coach that player? Yeah, I think that there's every player's got their their individual attributes and the challenge for a coach is to, is to make sure that you, you fit your best players in. Like people talk about formations, I'm not massive on formations, if I'm honest. I'm, I'm bigger on principles. You know, like I, I want us to start to recognise, for example, that if there's a chip pass from right side centre half to uh, to the opposition fullback, like we're going to jump it. So our fullback will jump to their fullback, and if he flicks it around the corner, uh, we'll have to deal with it. You know, but so it's those type of things that um, I wouldn't say educate the crowd, but the crowd will start to recognise uh, that sort of. Uh, pressing ability and how and how we'll we'll work towards that. Um, Ryan, for example, I think look, he's a he's a tough player. You know, he's a competitor. I think he's got a voice for a 23 year old. Clearly, it sometimes uh, sort of steps into uh, maybe over aggressive at times. But we want to give a player like that like total clarity for for when he can. Uh, go and be aggressive in terms of a straight ball into a centre forward. I'm happy for him to go and uh, sort of shut it down 15, 20 yards. So it's those type bits of clarity that the players need to make bold decisions. So I'll try and remove that element of fear and blame um, by giving them that clarity as much as possible. But he also has on the ball attributes. You know, I think the last game of the season was a great example. I want my centre halves to be able to carry the ball out and attack the space, um, and therefore you've got a constant threat then, and waves of attacks sort of going in at opponents, and that's what we're trying to achieve. You know, making sure that um, we have that numeracy in the right places, not the wrong places, as we build to try and score a goal. I think uh, my thunder got stolen there a bit by Gav. I was going to ask a very similar question, but did, in a previous job, did you ever manage, uh, did you ever scout any of the players that are in the current squad that you were thinking about maybe taking to Sunderland? Or, uh, yeah, absolutely. Like Kevin Nisbet was one. Uh, probably illegally approached him four or five times. So <laughs> <that. laughs> um, but no, I, like, I think obviously like Kevin at his best is a top player, you know, he's one that I've wanted to get hold of um, for a number of years. Obviously, Dave Marshall, we actively was trying to sign a, a couple of my other clubs. Um, I think everybody's had that sort of good look at Doig, you know. Um, yeah. uh, he was a, a bright up-and-coming player and now seems to be really experienced, even though he's only sort of 19, 20. So, um, obviously, a challenge to keep hold of players like that as well. Um, a club like this because there's a lot of interest in players yeah. like that down south from, from big clubs so um, yeah but I think look, we're in a good place I think that I'm, I'm really positive of course I'm new uh, so I'm going to come in with that fresh enthusiasm um, but I feel like naturally it's the way I am anyway hopefully that transcends into the players and they can uh, buy in as quickly as possible Okay if you don't mind can I just ask as well if how how young is too old for a grown man to wear a replica kit? <laughs> well, that's a real. Are we talking socks and well, shorts as well? I think I think let's start with the top, but that's then we can sort of progress. To the I think kit. like top in terms of top and jeans, like you can go to your, you know what I mean, until your dying day wearing wearing <laughs> your shirt with jeans on. But once we start stepping into shorts and varicose veins, and you know what I mean, and <laughs> hairy legs and all that goes on with that. Yeah. Maybe maybe you've got to be in and around your prime or under 14 to be able to get whatever full kit. <laughs> I'm not sure on that. I think it's once the belly starts appearing, I think that's when the, the kit needs to go. <laughs> anyway, I'll hand over. Okay. So, Lee, this question is, obviously, before you accepted the job, there was a little bit of a stigma around it in terms of 
maybe managers might have been frightened to go for the job or thought that they would have been up against it just with the, the way the two previous managers left. How, how did Ron and Ben sell the club to you? Um, I remember in your first interview, you said you had a meeting down in London that lasted for, meant it last one hour, but ended up lasting for three. So what type of things did you speak about that in, in that meeting and how did they sort of sell the job to you? Yeah, I think, first of all, I was cautious, if I'm honest with you, I was, because I think it's natural to be, you know, like, I know a lot about Jack Ross, and obviously his successes and mm -hmm. quality as a manager, and obviously they decided to make the change for whatever reason, and then uh, Sean Maloney comes in as a young manager, highly regarded coach, and, and obviously uh, moves on pretty quickly, so for, for somebody like me that's just been sacked from Sunderland, uh, and, and where I was in terms of the sort of like some a lot of times in football like a manager's uh, perception becomes the reality do you know what i mean so the perception yeah. of him becomes like your own yeah. reality and like obviously in and around sort of second third fourth at bristol city um i was getting interest from sort of premier league teams in england and then uh football uh, whatever changes and that's why you can never be uh, too comfortable and um, my dad was manager in Latvia and they had a saying called never relax and, and that's a little bit like football management because it can turn very quickly both positive and negative so um, obviously disappointed to lose my job at Sunderland two points off top of the league um, and that, nothing, another massive club um, a big historic fan base and, and I, I'm in a position or was in a position before I got this job where the next one was really important. You know, it was really important for me and my career, but also really important for the football club that I can add value um, to, the, to the club and what they've already got. So, like I say, that original caution, if I'm honest, was sort of nullified really quickly. And that was due to, like, knowing a lot about Hibs, first and foremost. So the size of the club, the size of the fan base, the history uh, attached to Hibs is what is what I love, you know but I, I need to be able to work with a hierarchy really well and I need support. You know, you can't uh, achieve success in this game without support from the hierarchy. And, and that was the, the key factor really. And I think it, it's a nice, it's nice timing for both of us because I feel like the club need that stability and I need that stability as well. So you've got to build that rapport. You've got to build the connection um, with the family, with the ownership um, with the key stakeholders, if you like, and the ones you're going to be um, dealing with every day. And obviously that was Ben, Ian, Ron himself as a decision maker, and obviously the key staff um, that we've got, but also are going to bring in. And in the end, I did have options, being honest, I did have options, but I couldn't stop that feeling of thinking about Hibs, watching Hibs. It's funny, actually, uh, I think I mentioned it before, but I was in the, uh, I actually went to a couple of the games, like in yep. Cognito. So I didn't, I didn't quite have a fake nose, moustache and glasses on, but it wasn't far off. Um, and then the Livingston game, I was, uh, I was thinking I was fine five minutes before the game, like all chilled, no one sat around me. All of a sudden, like 300 of the sort of Livy Ultras come in and sit like directly around me. <laughs> and I couldn't get out because I didn't <laughs> want to be seen. And obviously, Livy um, won the game. And, and when they scored, I was being smoked out by the yellow and black flares. And uh, it, it was like, I swear, if anybody sees me celebrate Livy's goal, let alone because I didn't want to didn't end up getting beat up by a sort of a gang of yous. But um, <laughs> it was interesting. And actually, a really nice vibe. Uh, and, and they were brilliant. And uh, like I say, it seemed like a really good good young crew in there but it was interesting just to I felt I had to see it you know I felt like mm -hmm. the club and the team needed to do a little bit more but it's all good and well watching video but you need to you need to see the dynamics live um, and therefore I believed I could add value and help uh, and, and the process continued. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to ask just one more question to you. Um, another thing from that interview that sort of interested me was you said that um, <clears throat> you enjoy history and sort of getting into the psyche of a club and their fan base. What type of things have you done to uh, sort of immerse yourself in that Hibs culture? And was there a piece of history that you found out about Hibs that sort of stuck out to you? Yeah, I found that, uh, yeah, I've 
it's something that I'm really interested in. So I'm obviously keen to learn a lot more. It's not so much like the history of the cup wins and stuff like that and the famous games. It's more about the people and the fan base and, you know, where your great granddad came from and where he sat mm-hmm. on the terraces and the job that he worked, you know, and what, what they want to see when it comes to a match day. So obviously uh, the history in terms of the Irish potato famine and then uh, the Irish sort of coming across to, to Edinburgh and then the priest uh, setting up the club and then merge basically to to stop the the trouble if you like mm. um, and then obviously the the Scottish and the Irish sort of coming together to form uh, Hibernia I think what it was called which was actually Latin wasn't it for, uh, mm. for Irish FC um, which again is or Ireland FC which is key um, but yeah it's it's just interesting to me you know I just I'm a bit of a history geek i'd say and uh, i do like learning so anything you can uh, advise me on i'll be uh, eternally grateful <laughs> no jack's the one with all the knowledge in our podcast me and charlie are clueless <laughs> but no i'll pass you on i don't know what it says about your mental state that you voluntarily watched us against dundee and then chose another game to go to um <laughs> even as fans we were like mm, <laughs> i'm not sure about that um the question I had was, you mentioned you've got 470-odd games uh, under your belt as a manager. What have been your highlights and what's your biggest learn from those games that you can bring to benefit Hibs? You know what, I honestly think you never stop learning. I mean, I'm a completely different manager now to the one I was sort of as a young gunslinger going in at Oldham. Um, like, the, you never stop learning, like leadership, sort of periodization, tactical play. What stands out for me is is people, you know, to be able to manage and bring the best out in people. I think we managed to do that well. I think Bristol City was more of a trading success, although we competed at the top of the league the last two or three seasons, and I on £100 million pounds off of players, if you like, developed and sold. So that that's not easy. You know, you've got to do that as a collective. That's not me claiming that. That becomes the the coaches, the psychologists, the fans, you know, this playing style, everything that goes into trading players at that level um, is really important because you've got to maximise everything. Um, I think that stands out. I think obviously galvanising a football club is important as well. And you can do that certainly with a playing style, winning games um, and bringing success. Uh, I think Sunderland's a good example of that. I think it's the first cup win uh, it was only the Papa John's, which is not the most sort of celebrated tournament, but long time that, that the club hadn't won at Wembley. Um, and, it, and it put us on that sort of path to success, if you like, and, and got people believing again. Um, and then, like, it's just so much to it. Like the big games, you know, like playing, managing against coaches like Bielsa, Guardiola, Mourinho, like fantastic experiences for me. And like, Playing against Bielsa, let me tell you, who I consider probably as the best with Guardiola and Mourinho, is an education. And uh, it's a, there are sort of open channels in your mind to be able to, to learn and improve and, and adapt and, and modify your game model already, but then obviously try and improve it as much as possible. So, yeah, I've been very lucky with the... Uh, the games I've had, the managers I've come across and uh, and the players I've been fortunate enough to work with. And uh, this is just the, the new exciting part of the journey for me, the next chapter and something that I'm really looking forward to. You saw I touched on it earlier. I just wonder, I think, for me, I could think I can see a lot of similarities sort of between Hibs and Sunderland as clubs. They probably, the general fan bases probably feel like we're set up to be more successful than we have been probably at both times when you've taken over the roles. Is there anything that you've maybe learned at Sunderland or any of your previous jobs that you think will really help you in the role up here? Yeah, well, I think we're probably better set up here in terms of behind the scenes. You know, like there was a lot of holes in the organisation at Sunderland. It had been on a sort of downward slope really for a long time. So that was sort of like turning the ship around, if you like, and trying to um, push it in the right direction. I don't feel like this is a this is a ship that's moving in the wrong direction. I think it's it's moving in the right direction. Like the bit I've enjoyed is it's been a can do culture. Um, you know, I've come into the football club and everything I've asked for so far that they, they've they've accepted and, and tried really hard, if you like, to put in place. 
um, and some of that's financial and some of that's organizational and some of that's structural. But it's really important because of now, as you get older, as you get more experience, you, you have a defined way of working, if you know what I mean. And uh, yes, you've got to bring the staff members and, and the right staff in, but that should be cohesive with what's already there at the football club. And uh, if we can get that spirit, um, if we can get that um, unity, if you like, as a staff, including players, again, it's something that can be really powerful in my eyes. So I think I can see the red flags a lot earlier than maybe I could earlier in my career. And I think uh, in terms of Sunderland, that was a big benefit because there's a lot of red flags at a club like that that you, that you collect and have to, have to uh, put right, really. And we did, uh, not just myself, but uh, everybody obviously working in that organisation. Um, just to say, it's, it's so refreshing, like having a new manager come in and already know so much about the club. Like you've clearly done your research, like the way you've been able to speak to the club. Like it's just refreshing. It's great to know. Um, so there's no surprise when I say that the biggest game on the calendar, as soon as the fixtures get announced, is going to be the Edinburgh Derby. And um, no point asking you what you're most excited for. But just how excited are you to manage the big games for Hibs against the likes of Hearts, Rangers, Celtic, and going away to Tyne Castle and trying to get victories at those types of stadiums? I'll be honest, it was one of the big draws for me. It really was to come up. Obviously, I've been played in a Hibs Hearts derby before. Um, like, that was the biggest derby I'd played in and the most passionate derby I'd played in. As a manager, I haven't had great derbies, if I'm honest with you. Probably like Oldham Rochdale was the best one. Like, didn't get the Bristol uh, derby, didn't get the sort of Newcastle Sunderland derby. Um, Barnsley like had a few, but you know what I mean, not not the sort of same sort of level of passions that you'll get uh, Hibs versus Hearts. And listen, Robbie Nielsen's a great mate of mine. I've got to be honest with you, like he's a really good friend of mine. Um, to the point where I said, I think in the press, I said I'm coming for you, Curly Toe. They they reported it as Curly Top, but Robbie Nielsen's uh, Curly Toe uh, came from his passing quality either missed the first centre forward, went to the second centre forward, curled out of play. <laughs> or, um, but it, yeah, he, he sent me a lovely text back saying, listen, I'm really looking forward to this derby. It's going to be the curly toe Cuban heel derby because obviously uh, I'm not the tallest of managers. So I think that yeah, we've already got that little bit of, um, uh, like I say, spirit going between us, if you like, to, to try and win. But it's a big game and I love big games. Like I expect the players to, to love big games, to bring their best out in those games. And again, we want to be front foot. Like we, we're not going to be sitting back. We're going to be aggressive in those games. And um, listen, we might get the odd pasting every now and again where we get it wrong. Um, but at the same time, I think that we'll win more games than we lose uh, having that attitude. Thanks, Lee. Uh, Lee, a question that was on my mind and I presume a lot of supporters' minds was the future of like David Gray when you came in. So what experience and value do you think having David Gray on your coaching staff will offer to Hibs? Yeah, I think um, really experienced. You know, I'm delighted that he wants to stay. It was, it was brilliant that um, obviously he started his coaching career so well and he's had that experience now of taking the caretaker role. And when they've had that, um, and they felt it, you know, players letting them down, players performing for them, the pressure of having to pick the team, the communication, like quickly they understand what a manager goes through. And I think David will be exactly the same now, you know, and a, a good assistant, if you like, is key to um, be whatever the manager's not on the day. If you know what I mean, if I come in full of enthusiasm, they can be nice and chilled and relaxed. And But if I'm maybe concentrating on a board meeting, Later on in that afternoon, they have to bring the energy. Um, but he's been through a process now, you know, gone from player to coach very quickly. Um, looking forward to, to uh, helping him in his coaching career, but also looking forward to learning off him, um, okay. particularly about Hibs as a club, uh, about the players, because, of course, he's got that inside knowledge already. Um, and, yeah, I think it's a nice match. We had a good game of golf the other day, um, of which we managed to beat... Uh, Ian Gordon, so he's delighted with that at the Renaissance. Um, so yeah, he's, he's a good golfer as well, and so is Ian Gordon actually. So I was questioning whether they were doing enough work to be that good at golf. And another question, if I can, just 
on sort of senior players like Paul Hanlon, Darren McGregor? Do you think there'll be similar pathways for them to join your coaching staff when they retire? Well, I think that it's, it's certainly an option. You know, you, you've got to get the balance. You can't have uh, too many coaches. Um, but I think, like, you know, the player like Lewis Stevenson is a good example. Uh, Hanlon has discussed. McGregor, all these guys like, have got huge experience um, in their career and in Scotland, more importantly. And, and they can, we can use that, if you like, to channel the younger players um, into being as best as they can be. And they have to be great personalities and then they have to obviously be good coaches as well. But to be honest, it, it would be determined by their quality. You know, there won't be any favours. It will be about what they can bring um, to the organisation, to the party. And uh, at that age, obviously, you do start thinking about what's next. And I think um, it's natural. And we'll always try and help players, um, both present and past, as best as we can at these football clubs. And it's the right thing to do. My final question is kind of also on the coaching side. Um, our last kind of manager, we, we brought in quite a robust coaching team. There's quite a few positions there filled um, with quite specific technical kind of duties, if you like. So on paper, it seems from the outside, there's quite a few vacancies there um, as well. Uh, so we know that sort of Jamie McAllister should be joining the club. Um, I'm interested, you know, what kind of coaching team do you see your final um, staff looking like and what areas uh, in terms of like, technical specific areas do you like to fill? You know, we're going to get a, a Liverpool style throwing coach anytime soon. We can. We might have to have a whip round to get <laughs> another throw-ins coach. Um, yeah, I, I think that the first thing to do and the reason I haven't, sort of come steaming in, if you like, like a bull in a china shop with the staff is because you, you want to see what qualities you've already got in the building. And I think it's really important that you don't just bring your mates in. You know, of course, you've got to trust uh, your staff in and around you, but um, it has to be right for the football club. I think that's the key. So I've wanted to take my time um, a little bit more on this. I want the club to interview um, any potential staff member as well, because I think that's important. You know, they have to fit into the culture of the group and like, they have to be able to um, get on with people. You know, we want a nice environment. Yes, uh, we're going to have an environment that, that we sort of demand, if you like, but also it's got to be warm. And uh, people have got to want to come in and be able to have banter. We've got to look after each other because there's a lot of sabotage to, to a performance, you know, the external noise and the press, there seems to be a lot that gets out uh, from the football club, which is something I've got to understand why and how. Um, so all these things, um, for me, are just areas of the job that I've got to focus on and, and you need good staff members and good employees to be able to wrap around each other, look after each other when it's not going quite so well and then flourish um, and, and continue to grow when it is going well. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure those announcements um, will come within the next sort of two or three weeks, but we do have to get it right. Um, because like I say, there's a lot of good staff already at the football club and we've got to make sure that we're economical and not just wasting attributes. Just to change the tone a wee bit, Lee, we get um, people send us in daft questions uh, to our podcast. Um, so if if I if I may just give you sort of three quick fire ones and then I'll be I'll be done. Uh, so the first one is: if you were a wizard, what spell would you use every day? Oh, um, I'd probably make myself invisible. And uh, how could toilets be better? How could toilets be better? Yeah, like heated yeah. seats or the music player or face another way. Arts toilet roll. Yeah, newspaper right. to hand. Newspaper in the... Yeah. Smell, smell reduction. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, can, you, can you name a hairy dog? A hairy dog? Um, oh, wow. Uh, cockapoo? No, it was Gary. It was a missing dog that was in my street, but they found it now. But <laughs> good, good guess anyway. But that's all for me, thanks. Okay, mate. <laughs> Um, ju just the last one from me, Lee. Um, I just wanted to know, what does success at Hibs look like to you? It means competing in the upper echelons of the league, that's for sure. Um, look, 
I was up here, like I say, when I was at Hearts, we managed to break the old firm. You know, that, that, that's a big step. Um, whether that's the short term aim, it's certainly the long term aim. But to do that, we're going to have to bring through top youth players. We're going to have to make sure that uh, we hold our best players at key times um, and build like an unbelievable, powerful unit, you know, all the way through from fan base to hierarchy at the football club. But it's doable, you know. Um, the cups are obviously um, key sort of performance indicators for success as well. And, and a consistency of hitting the European places, you know. So, like, can, can I guarantee any of it? No, I can't. What I can guarantee is that we'll play our way, we'll play it hard, we'll work every single day doing everything we can to bring success and happiness and fun um, to the football club. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have a really good journey uh, and, and, like, provide a level of performances that make the fan base proud because... As we as we realised in lockdown, football is nothing without, <coughs> it. and uh, you know we want as many as we can behind us um, for as long as we can. And there'll be ups and there'll be downs, and you know I'm big and ugly enough to be able to take the stick um, when it comes, and it will. But at the same time, I've got a real belief in what we can do here, and uh, we'll continue on the right path. And I'm sure that it will come to us in the end because we'll make more right decisions than wrong ones. Perfect. Um, I think this is my last one, but um, how, how do you define leadership or what or what do you expect from your captain and other leaders? I think we've got to develop leaders all throughout the football club. You know, each individual will have uh, their own USP when it comes to leadership. And that could be, just to give you an example, you know, uh, I don't know, a young player that's really good at chatting to people one-on-ones um, and can sort of put his arm around somebody and uh, make him feel a million dollars. The flip side of that, you get a senior player um, that might be able to like drive and rally the dressing room in terms of that voice, that sort of front foot warrior type feel, lead by example. And it's our job to nurture these leaders, if you like, all the way through the football club and your senior players are obviously key with that, but anybody should be able to step into that role. Um, and particularly the younger players coming through, like we want them to be able to have a voice, like not just be overawed um, by the senior players that are in the dressing room. So I think it's a nice dynamic down at HTC that I think even just the layout of the training ground and, and the way it is and the way you sort of bump into people along the corridors, you know, we, we have to create an environment there that encourages people, not just players, to, to bring their best qualities out and um, not be fearful of making mistakes, you know, whether that be off the pitch or on the pitch. Okay, thanks. Just one final one from myself. Um, as football fans, especially Hibs fans, like the key things I think it's fair to say we care about is games against Hearts, uh, cup runs, Europe, and finally, home form. I think home form, especially last season, was incredibly disappointing. Um, how do you aim to correct that this season? Well, like I said before, you're such an important part of that home form. You know, I think if you've got an understanding of how we want to play and you start seeing that um, in your mind's eye and then the lads are then producing it, because at the end of the day, once the lads cross the white line, it's up to them. So there's a psychology that goes with that. There's obviously a clarity um, and there's a bravery, you know, and, and I think that's the bit I can do. I can take, I can remove the element of fear, if you like, and, and shield the players from that as much as possible. And then hopefully they'll be able to go out and, and um, like bring their best. And I think that's the, for me, that's as a player, that's success. Like, and that's high performance, which is being able to bring your best when it matters most. And it matters most, obviously, when we're at home. Uh, playing in these big games in front of our own fans. So, look, listen, there's going to be lulls in the season. There's going to be bad performances. There's going to be uh, disasters along the way uh, over the next sort of three or four years. But on the whole, I'm really, really um, I've got a strong belief that we can be successful.
Well, Lee, thanks so much for your time today on behalf of Down the Slope, Long Bangers, Strong Opinion, Hibs and Hibs.net pod. It was great speaking to you and I think it's, I can speak on behalf of us all when I'm saying we're very excited for your tenure at the club. Thank you. No, I'm really looking forward to it and appreciate uh, everybody and even the question about the dog, which I didn't really get. But <laughs> <laughs> Nobody does, don't worry about it. <laughs> I, did, I didn't know if that was a local, local joke, I'm not sure. <laughs> Barely a joke. <laughs> uh, hardly counts, does it? Uh, I was saying that, don't worry. 